Yeah, let's go and get started. Uh, give it the uh, the standard five minutes. So, um, welcome everybody to the Open Show Los Angeles number seventy one. Uh, I'm excited to uh, hear three presenters who you will soon get to see and uh, hear about their work and uh, a little bit of logistics. Um, we're going to be uh, th have three presenters today. They're going to spend about 15, maximum 20 minutes on their portfolio. They'll talk to you about them. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them um, in the chat window. In the bottom of your screen, there's a chat window there. Uh, just click on that and put in your question, and we'll make sure that they get uh, answered. And um, after each presenter, there will be a short Q&A, um, you know, maybe a, a few minutes. And then at the end of the um, presentation of, uh, from all three presenters, we'll have another Q&A that will cover um, everybody. So you have about uh, at least a couple chances to get in your questions and so on and your comments. So um, uh, feel free to leave your video on, but make sure that you are muted uh, just in case you know there are other sounds um, that, that we can control. And um, FYI, uh, we are recording this session uh, just so that you are uh, aware of it, like a full disclosure that uh, this Zoom meeting is being recorded. And um, if you're not signed up um, uh, to our email address, please go ahead and do so. You can go to uh, openshowla.com uh, and you can uh, sign up uh, to get on our email um, uh, list so that you get um, our next open call and also, you know, the, the next uh, the next show, okay? And lastly, I wanted to thank those of you who donated uh, when you signed up. Uh, open Show LA is free, but uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, but donation is always uh, appreciated. So thank you to those who did. Um, appreciate, we appreciate it. So already, any questions so far? If not, uh, I'm going to be uh, doing a couple minutes an intro to um, Open Show LA. Uh, some of you are new, uh, but some of you are actually uh, alumni of Open Show LA. So welcome back. Um, thank you for joining. So for those of you who don't know about uh, Open Show LA, uh, I'll do a little intro. And then right after that, uh, we would go into the presentations. Okay. All righty. Again, uh, there's a, uh, all right. Okay, open show, Elliot. Thank you, Jonas, for, for that. All right, I'm gonna share my screen pretty soon. So, all righty. Okay, it won't be long. Open Show Los Angeles. And uh, as it turns out, Open Show is a uh, sort of a, a global, uh, non global organization. We have uh, multiple chapters in other cities as well. Uh, this is an old map. Uh, you can see that there are many cities who have had Open Show uh, within their uh, locale. So, um, um, We've been around for about 12 years. Uh, Jonas has been uh, hosting since the beginning. And uh, the, the, the San Francisco is the first open show. And then Los Angeles is the second one. So um, yeah, we've been doing it for 12 years. Uh, some of these cities that you see, um, some of them are very active and some of them are not. So just wanted to give you that heads up. 
But uh, there are, yeah, many other cities that, that has open show uh, events uh, they would plan, uh, you know, uh, locally. So uh, we are sort of a regional organization. We have bi-monthly artist talks uh, with the mission to get your work seen for about 12 years now. Um, so we have a platform to, to let the photographers, uh, visual story, storytellers to connect with artists, getting feedback on their portfolios and, and things like that. So we've been doing it for a while. And this is our website, uh, openshowla.com. And uh, you you go there to be able to see um, you know, what's going on with our next upcoming events. And you can also sign up for the mailing list, okay? So an intro is that we are co-producers. Uh, Richard, I'm Richard. Jonas is also here. He's he's the guy with the guitars in the back and the wall. So we are both producers of Open Soul LA. Uh, these are these are all contact information. Yeah, uh, in uh, Twitter, uh, in uh, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, also, our website is here as well. RichardSchild.com and JonasYip.com. So you want to connect with us? Um, feel free to do so. And uh, we have 2023 events. You can click on this link and uh, and you can see what's going on this year. And uh, thank you for attending. Um, just a little bit of a heads up. Uh, our next event, uh, Open Show Los Angeles uh, number 72 will be in person. Um, it's gonna be in Los Angeles. Uh, we're gonna try to uh, have a Zoom meeting uh, for audiences so that they can see what's going on. But uh, we are, that event, we're gonna be partnering with um, uh, Photo LA. Uh, they have, a, they have a, a contest called Focus Photo LA. And uh, they are gonna have uh, 20 uh, finalists being displayed in Gallery 12 in Bagamon Station in Santa Monica. So we're going to be um, having open show on site at the gallery on Sunday, um, November 17th or something like that. So um, um, for those of you who are in LA, please um, mark your calendar. Uh, if you can come by, it would be great to see you. And uh, we also will publish potentially a Zoom meeting so you can watch uh, the presentation, okay? Just want to give you a heads up. Um, in addition to that, most of you are uh, photographers here, or some of you are. Um, if you want to enter the contest, um, please go ahead and do that. Uh, and uh, go to focus.followla.com and you can enter the, um, the contest. Um, it's still open until sometime in October. So you have time to, to get your images in, okay? All right, with no further ado, uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna be um, presenting uh, the first presenter. Let me go ahead and unshare so that you don't see all my desktop stuff. Okay, here we go. Our first presenter today uh, will be uh, Victor. Uh, Victor is a uh, Los Angeles native. He's been here for a while. He's been taking pictures for a very long time, like, like when he was 12 years old. So he has shown in many galleries, um, uh, having you know a lot of uh, awards. So um, uh, today uh, he'll be sharing a interesting project, in in my opinion, about light. Uh, it's a sort of a combination between science and art. So I can't wait to to hear more from Victor. So Victor, go ahead and take over, and you can present now. Okay, thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Get, uh, get this started here. Okay, is that coming through okay? Yes, we can see. Okay, well, thanks everyone for, for coming and spending a, a little time here. I, I much appreciated. Um, 
this. So this is uh, my latest project that I'm, I'm working on, and it's a continuing work at, at this point, and, and I call it uh, Portrait of the Quantum. And uh, so the main idea of this project is to directly image light, uh, ultraviolet light in this case, for, uh, for a reason, ultraviolet light onto a photosensitive surface without camera or a physical subject. So, uh, so really, light. I wanted light and its and its quantum mechanical properties, its its uh, uh, its scientific properties, to be the subject of the photograph, and to show directly some of the the you know beautiful, interesting, and and frankly some spooky properties of of light energy. Uh, so, so the idea is that light itself is the the subject, and uh, so I, I can do this without a camera and without <laughs> any type of subject. Uh, and so as I go through, I'll be showing some examples um, and, and talking a little bit more about how, you know, kind of how this happens. This particular one is a, uh, uh, the, the black part of the image is uh, platinum and palladium, and the uh, blue is uh, cyanotype. And so I'll talk about why, you know, why that is in a second. Um, this one, uh, this image here is made from, uh, Cyanotype is the, the blue part of the image, and then the, the red part is gum bichromate uh, with a red pigment. And so uh, gum bichromate ordinarily is kind of this transparent yellowish color. Uh, but the interesting thing about the gum bichromate emulsion is that you can add uh, whatever color pigment that you want, as long as it's water soluble. So that's that one. And here's another one, again, that's uh, platinum and, uh, and cyanotype. And, and so, uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, photography is uh, both an art and a science. And so kind of for the science part of this project, uh, again, I mentioned I'm using platinum palladium, cyanotype, and gum bichromate emulsions. And uh, these emulsions are sensitive to ultraviolet light and almost not sensitive at all to the visible light that, that we can see with our eyes. Uh, and so in order to expose th these uh, uh, emulsions, I use ultraviolet light sources. Uh, so I use uh, ultraviolet lasers, uh, ultraviolet flashlights, and, and the sun. Uh, the sun has a lot of ultraviolet light in it. And I shoot, I shoot the, this UV through pinholes, uh, double slits, as it's called, irregular glass, uh, transparent glass, uh, reflected off of metallic surfaces. And that brings out the, the quantum mechanical effects of the light. And so they're, technically they're called interference patterns. So there's interference, refraction, reflection, and diffraction patterns. And those are the, the, the things that I capture on the, on the emulsion, right? So, so then again, and, and so uh, I capture these patterns on hand-coated paper. So all these are uh, actual chemistry that you need to mix and then uh, uh, brush on to, uh, to either paper, and I use mostly uh, cotton, cotton rag paper. Although I have used like cotton, like in t-shirts. I tried this on t-shirts, and uh, silk and glass, and basically any surface that once it's exposed to the emulsion, the emulsion will adhere to it and won't wash off as you you're trying to develop it and and fix it. And so, and so here's some more examples of of some of these uh, patterns that that. Uh, uh, that can be uh, you know brought out. So again, this one because it's red, so there's a bichromate emulsion with a red pigment. This one here is a, a kind of lyrical, and it's a uh, uh, platinum palladium with and cyanotype. Right. Uh, this one here's a little little cyanotype. Okay, so you can get some you know interesting patterns, and they're 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 quite different. Some are more chaotic, some are more smooth. Um, and then to talk a little bit about the art, uh, then uh, again, it's a matter of finding these cool shapes, and then capturing and composing those into an image. Um, uh, so this one here, for example, is uh, seven different uh, exposures. Uh, and captured all on, on one, you know, on one piece of paper. And again, this one is a, a platinum. The black part is platinum, and then the blue parts are cyanotype. Uh, but there's seven different uh, 
several different exposures on, on this to capture the different parts of the image. Okay. And again, a little bit about the art. Uh, I, I do use cotton rag, as I've mentioned, for the, for the most part. Uh, but I have also used the handmade Japanese washi, mashi, and kozo papers uh, for the matrix. I've tried, I've experimented also a little bit with cotton t-shirts, and I'm going to try silk. Uh, the problem with the cotton t-shirt is that the image came out pretty cool looking and cyanotype. The problem is once you wash it, the, the blue part kind of washes away, and it leaves this kind of brown, uh, yellow image. And so if anybody out there knows how to fix the blue, <laughs> the blue cyanotype onto a cotton t-shirt, I'd like to talk to you <laughs> afterwards. Uh, and, and, the, and unfortunately, uh, so I scanned, these are scans of, of, the, uh, of the originals. And so you can't really, you know, feel or see the, the textures. Uh, it comes out a little bit through the scan, but, but really uh, uh, it, it, it's a quite a different experience to look at these in, you know, in person. So, okay. And then uh, this is an example of, uh, this is on a, a, a Japanese paper and it's a, a cyanotype. And, and so these are kind of abstracts. I mean, they're, they, look, they look like abstractions. They, they remind people of different things. This one in particular kind of looks to me like a Japanese uh, vegetable knife, <laughs> uh, but you know, other people see different things in, in these. And here's another little little cyanotype. This is about the size of a postcard. And as as I was kind of going through this going through this project, I, uh, one idea that popped up is like, well, what makes a photograph valuable? Like, why why do people ascribe value to to certain photographs and not to others? Uh, and and it, it kind of has to do you know with the artist. Like an Ansel Adams print is is uh, quite valued uh, by everybody. Uh, you know, more than most, um, it might have to do with the subject, uh, generally speaking, silver, uh, silver gelatin prints are valued more than, uh, you know, ink pigment prints. Um, and so kind of with that idea, I started experimenting with the, with trying to embed, uh, I've got a, a bunch of micron scale diamonds and some metallic gold. And so I, in some of these pictures, I put that into the emulsion. And so you get this really cool kind of glittery effect as, as you move, you know, by the image. So it kind of adds a dimension of movement and of time in, in, into the into the photograph. Uh, and, and again, unfortunately, you can't really see that from the uh, from the scan. Uh, but but some experimenting with that dimension of, of photography as well. And then here's another couple of uh, of examples. So this is a little cyanotype. Uh, there's a cyanotype on, on again on a more textured Japanese paper, and and this this particular uh, the the photograph on the left kind of uh, I, I had a turn in my practice. Uh, I, I made the one on the left, and I thought, and it's on a Japanese paper, which is very light and translucent. So I thought, well, let me try to make it into kind of a a, a negative, if you will. And so then I coated the paper on the right with uh, the cyanotype, put the one on the left on top of it and left it in the sun and kind of came out with a, within a, a negative or a positive. I'm not sure what, <laughs> what, what, what to call it. Uh, but then what happened was I showed uh, the photograph on the left to a critique group that I was in with Jonathan Blostein. And some people said, you know, that looks like high heels. And some people said, you know, that looks like an ax or another person saw a toothbrush there. And I, I kind of looked at it and I thought I saw like a, a saxophone almost. And so when, when with that discussion, it kinda, uh, I kind of decided that I wouldn't give any evocative titles to any of these um, because I didn't want people to, or I didn't want to put my vision of what I see in here into other people's you know, mind and let, let them bring their own experience and their own, uh, ideas of, of what these are and what they see in it. So, uh, so I decided not to give them any, any titles that had you know, any meaning. Uh, on the other hand, then you, you need to catalog them somehow. And so I came up with this catalog scheme that's kind of random 
uh, random letters and numbers. And uh, that way, when you do want to talk about a particular piece, you can both be on the same page of which one is that you're, you know, it is that you're talking about. Um, so, so this this particular photograph kind of changed the, the direction of, of this project a, uh, a little bit, right? And then this, uh, so this is the same image. Another thing that kind of is interesting about this project is. Uh, this is the same image, and a lot of these images, if you turn them 90 degrees or if you turn them 180 degrees, you get a completely different feel or vibe or, you know, something from these. So, uh, so again, this is the same image, uh, but I, the bottom one is turned upside down or turned 180 degrees, I should say, not upside down. And kind of the top one to me kind of looks like a sunset over, over an ocean a little bit. And then the the bottom one looks more like a rainstorm, over, you know, over this over a setting sun or, or you know something like that. And I guess if you turn them vertical, then you know other people might see other things. So I'm trying also not to ascribe or or to put a orientation on these, and again let people uh, bring their own uh, views of it. And I'm kind of doing that by when when on the back I'll, I'll write the title or I'll write the catalog number on it and one you know, on one side, and then I'll, uh, if I need to, or, if, you know, if, they, if it sells, I'll sign it on the other side. So then that way it gives, it won't have a, uh, necessarily an orientation that I think it, it should be, and give the person who, you know, who is viewing it the opportunity to put, to orient it however they, see, you know, see it best. And here's another one. This this one to me kind of looks like a, either lily uh, flower, you know, lily flowers, or if you turn it uh, kind of vertical, it kind of looks like ostrich heads to me. And uh, you know, other people may see other other things. So, okay. All right. So this next this next photograph I'm going to show you is is kind of the, the purest photograph that there is. Um, basically, it's uh it's the uh, light. And it's shining through a pinhole on, onto the emulsion, and, and that's it. Again, there's no subject. There's actually no uh, glass or anything between the light source and the emulsion, except for this little pinhole. And uh, we don't know why, but when light uh, goes is squeezed through a pinhole, it it doesn't like it, and it diffracts out. It turns into kind of a it turns into this uh, uh, pattern of of a, of a target almost. And so we, again, on the scientific side, we really don't know why why that happens, but it, you know, that's what happens. And it actually was using techniques like this that uh, Rosalind Franklin, um, she was using x-rays and she was uh, helped to deduce the structure of DNA using this kind of technique by shooting uh, x-rays through, through a DNA crystal and looking at the diffraction patterns that came out. And then they were able to tell that, that the DNA is a double helix. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, and then here, here's some, some kind of some more examples. So again, a, a cyanotype with a platinum. It's kind of a bigger one. Uh, here's one on a very textured Japanese paper. So uh, another platinum. This one's kind of more smooth and, and lyrical. So you can see there's a lot of different shapes that are that, that can be produced. So this one looks like speed to me, like they're speed speeding or something. This one here looks like uh, uh, the March of Death. It looks like some skeletons with a veil on <laughs> to to me, but. <laughs> This one kind of looks like tulips to me. Uh, and here's two that uh, they're they're the same image, uh, reproduced six times. And the one on the left is uh, on, in platinum, and the one on the right is uh, cyanotype. And so you can kind of, you know, the the feeling's a little bit different. Uh, the platinum looks like it's more sensitive because it has more detail in it. Uh, generally speaking, the exposure times were about the same. Um, so the so the platinum get, gathered more was more sensitive to the light. All right. 
uh, and this is a, a another another one, and just to uh, give you the sense of the scale of this one in particular. Um, so it's uh, it, uh, I managed to get these to be, uh, you know, quite quite large sizes, and uh, basically these can be as big as you can as as long as the paper supports it. <laughs> except that if you're using platinum it's going to be horribly expensive <laughs> and so okay and this one i actually experimented with visible light uh uh you know some of the, these are this is some of the first ones that i did and so i used the uh, red green and blue lasers and i was using the, my camera sensor so i so i put a little pinhole in a piece of aluminum foil put that in front of my my camera sensor and and then shot the light through that um the thing is is the camera sensor is pretty small and uh, so it's not very flexible in terms of the imaging you can do and the other thing that i'm glad that didn't happen is like that it, apparently you can fry your your camera sensor with the with the laser light <laughs> and so i'm glad that didn't happen but <laughs> but anyway so so i did experiment with, with visible light Okay, to kind of start wrapping things up. So my bio, I was, I was born and grew up in East Los Angeles. I'm a, I'm a native. Uh, my profession was software, software engineering, software architecture. Uh, my projects have been exhibited and, and published nationally and internationally. And if you're interested, my, my site, uh, you can see them there, there on my site. Uh, and I'm currently retired from corporate life and, and live in Los Angeles and, and spend my time now with my photography addiction. In terms of uh, my aesthetic sensibility, I uh, was greatly influenced by the Dadaists, the Surrealists, and, and Jackson Pollock. So I was mostly influenced by painters, actually. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, the photographers that I really, uh, um, you know, that, had, that resonated with me, that'd be uh, Dwayne Michaels, Man Ray, and Jerry Uselman, primarily. And just a little bit about uh, this project again. Um, to, I guess to brag a little bit, I think it, it, it's a first of a kind. I don't know anybody else that's uh, done something like this. I presented this at uh, portfolio reviews, and, and none of the reviewers can say that someone else has done this before. So I think I'm the first. Uh, and again, each photographic object is unique. It's it's impossible to to duplicate it, uh, and I still have a lot of experimenting uh, to do. So. Uh, thank you, and thanks, Jonas and, and Richard. And uh, I guess if there's any questions, um, I can take some for a few minutes, guys. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Very, very unique um, portfolio. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, uh, just a reminder to everybody: um, if you have a, a questions or anything or a comment, uh, please uh, do that in the chat window. Um, so I have like a, a quick question, uh, Victor, to get the uh, you know, to get that going. So sure. since it's invisible, you wouldn't know, you know, right, right what the image is going to look like until actually it happened. That, that, yes, that's true. Uh, however, I, I, there's there's tends to be enough visible light that I, I think you know fluoresces off of the wall or off of whatever off of the paper that you can kind of get an idea of what. Uh, what it's going to be. I see. So, uh, do you, you know, are you able to control the the pattern or not really? Um. So so if you not really no, it's it's a it's a process of discovery. Oh, okay. So the, the light passes through a, a lumpy piece of glass, like a drinking glass or whatever, and mm -hmm. then the pattern emerges. And I, I, maybe someday after I've done this a lot. I would be able to kind of predict what it's going to look like, but but right now, no, it's still like a, a surprise. <laughs> and, and the thing is, if, if a nice pattern comes up and I don't capture it, it's almost impossible to get it back. Yeah, you know, it's almost impossible to, to, to right. It's uh, it's one of a kind. You know, it's almost like a moment in time. And yes. if you if you didn't capture it, it's gone. You know, right? Yeah. So very unique. It's really cool. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Uh, you you have a, a a few comments in the chat that said that this is this is wonderful, and uh, yeah, it's totally different. I've never seen anything like that before. So thank you. 
Um, for those of you who have maybe have questions later, we have a Q&A at the end. So just looking at the time, we wanted to move ahead. Thank you, Victor. We're gonna move, move ahead to uh, the next presenter. Uh, the next presenter uh, is gonna be Nancy. Uh, Nancy is currently in um, um, Seattle, right? Washington. Right. Yeah. Correct. So, um, and uh, thank you for joining today, Nancy. You've been taking pictures for a long time, I believe, and uh, you are quite prolific. Um, uh, you guys, uh, please go to look at Nancy's uh, website. She has uh, all kinds of portfolios and different things for you to take a look at. But uh, today, I think Nancy, she's going to be sharing uh, with us um, somewhat of personal project, family related, things like that. So can't wait to hear more about it, Nancy. So go for it. All right. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Let's see if we can share a screen. Excellent. Um, thank you for bearing with me. And thank you, um, Jonas and Richard and Open Show LA for making it possible for me to show um, this work tonight. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, what Richard said is, is true. This is a very personal work. Um, it's been a project that I've been working on off and on for almost a little over two years, really. And it springs from, it now kind of has several arms to it, and this is one. Um, and this particular one springs from photographs that my dad took. He was a very, very avid amateur photographer, self-taught completely, and took um, lots and lots of pictures of my mother and myself um, when I was a child. Um, so it's kind of a, it's more of a fictional, I guess I would say documentary. Um, I'm kind of visually speculating on this collection of photographs and images and facts that I have from family memories and then the photographs represented in and those memories and the images that maybe do and don't jive with certain memories and also how you can kind of wonder, was that what I remember on that day or what happened here between now and then? So that kind of transition. Um, and I was an only child, so I, I was very, much a part of of their life um but this particular part of the project deals with the fact that i might not have been an only child um there was another child also a girl who was born before me and didn't survive um and they named her julia and there's a grave somewhere um and that's really all I ever knew about her. They didn't discuss it. And somehow I just, I knew there were no more questions to it to be asked. Um, but I always have wondered who she was. Um, did she have, you know, a soul and, and, and a, a person, a person, you know, um, even on her, in her brief time, was she kind of a shadow over me? Did some part of her inhabit me who was the one who survived? And and what did it mean to be the one who survived, the only one? Um, and that raised a lot of questions too, as I looked at those photographs. And as I started working with them almost in collaboration, um, re-photographing them, um, putting them into a, a different context, I kind of began to wonder what kind of agreement did they have? What kind of thoughts did they have about how to overcome this grief and this pain and how to then fully appreciate the joy of having 
a child. Um, and so I started rephotographing some of the slides projected on a screen, and then I would blur it somewhat and rephotograph it. Um, some I photographed. This is also on the screen. Both of these are me, but in this dreamlike world could be maybe her spirit as well, crossing over with me somehow. So, um, and then others were slides that I <laughs> took a chance and they do get stuck, um, but popping, putting two of them layered over each other in a slide viewer, a very small slide viewer, and then getting a close-up photograph of that image. And then I take it, I try to take it one step further away from reality by doing drawings and markings over them. Um, this one particularly, I really wanted to um, kind of show my mother pregnant with me and a photograph also of me, but almost again, this presence of, you know, another child overlapping and maybe part of that soul going into um, the second child, the new child. Um, and then I, you know, I started thinking about, again, how did they come to terms? Did they just choose not to speak about it? Did they just choose to um, put it away, each of them? Did they do that privately? Did they do that in collaboration and cooperation? How did they handle that? And then I started thinking about the what happens to the soul um, and in buddhist philosophy there is a transitional process from death to rebirth and reincarnation called the bardo and i started making nature photographs and images that were kind of a concept of visual concept of what that might look like, which is different for every person. You, you can't predict it, you can't duplicate it, you, you can't really speculate it, but I tried to. And what might that be for, for Julia? Um, and what I did was, there are four of those bardo pieces in this presentation. And the, the first two are black and white, kind of the darkness, uh, the pain of leaving the physical body. And then later on, you will see um, they turn to color. And this I'm thinking is Again, is she looking over me? Even though these are both photographs of me, um, again, as a child, and then later on a, a self-portrait. And this is my mother in the doorway. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, did, did that grief kind of blunt her or blur her perception of happiness in some little way that she hid? She never, she never talked about it, so I don't know, you know? So it remains a bit of a mystery. And here we gradually come out slowly out of the pain and the bardo and into color, into some kind of 
Reformation. And then my dad, I ran across this unpacking some things recently, and my father took a little piece of my hair and saved it in an envelope. Um, and I thought that sort of that memento that he held on to, did he hold on to pain also, like the sharpness of the glass? And also the pain that we carry, like a weight, like a stone, or like a stillborn child. And this is another version of the hair piece. But now I've scratched out my name and I'm wondering, was that really a piece of my hair? It had to have been because she didn't survive birth, so. And then again here, the colored steps, the red steps, hopefully leading out of the pain and into enlightenment and rebirth. And this sort of reflects back to the image of my father and his silence. And I'm thinking perhaps my mother took her silence into her spine and it strengthened her, even though it, it never, the pain never went away. And then this last image is also a kind of a link to one of the other sections, which is deals with my mother at the end of her life when she was suffering severely with Alzheimer's and um, stage four lung cancer and kind of, and I stayed with her for the last three months um, on my own, left my husband, um, stayed in a hotel, went to the home every day and spent most of the day with her, even though we couldn't speak to each other anymore. Um, so again, that's a different kind of silence also. So that's kind of the link to another project that I'm working on still. So that's me. Thank you. Oh, and I'm very, very pleased that a number of these images um, and the, the other project uh, um, have received honorable mentions in the last couple and the most recent uh, 20th anniversary of the Juliet Margaret Cameron Awards for Women Photographers in the visual storytelling section. So uh, I was very, very pleased and honored by that. And um, it, it made it all worthwhile. So again, thank you. Thank you for everyone for taking the time to listen and look. Thank you, Nancy. Um, congratulations, by the way, on the recent reward. Uh, that's a good one. Um, I can I can see why because uh, uh, look, look at these uh, images that are very uh, provocative. You know, like what is it? You know, you you almost have to look at it and and ask a lot of questions, like mm -hmm. what's going on here. So that's that's why it's so intriguing. Thank you. Um, so. Um, you guys, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, put it in the chat. Um, Nancy, there's a couple of uh, kudos. Uh, oh. That they, they, oh, thank you. <laughs> like, they like your work. They love it. Uh, thank you. They, they thank you for joining it. So, um, very much. I, I was just curious. Um, it's is it is it something that you're gonna continue to work on with momentals from the past or? Um, I'm trying to do it uh, with a bit of both, kind of trying to bridge the past and the future in a way, um, and the present, obviously, but um, trying to incorporate, um, especially the Bardo images are definitely current outside of this um, repository, if you like, or these archival pieces. So I think I'd like to do more in, in 
weaving images like that together and also incorporating more more text in a way as well yeah uh, you also write if i yes. remember correctly yes so you're kind of a poet too as well yeah so which my dad was also he was a writer my mother was an artist so it's kind of like we're all collaborating together over time that's right you, you have the genes of both you know yeah. hopefully <laughs> Hopefully, they can live good. up to that legacy. That's this is big. Um, I when I saw one of your early images, that's um, <clears throat> that were kind of blurred. I guess mm -hmm. you did it on purpose. I get it. Yes. And then, um, there are also some outlines. Those were yes. done digitally, I think. Yeah. Yes. Oh, correct. Okay. Yes. So what I'm just curious. What prompted you? to do that i was just curious that's that's very intriguing you know the way it was done but i was just wondering how you got that idea or what is what are you trying to portray in that message i guess in a way i wanted to put an, another layer over it hmm. to again in a way put some some i guess i guess distance between the actual memory or the actual image and the final image to kind of make a corridor of vision, a corridor of memory. So you have to kind of go into, I want, I really want the, the viewer um, to want to go into kind of like some of the medieval paintings, which had pieces of bits of allegory hidden in the image um, or tucked away in a corner. Um, so I, I, that's kind of what I'm trying to build the world a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And make it, and actually <laughs> maybe make it more complicated for the viewer so that it's not an, just a, a glance. You have to, I really want people to spend time with each image and go deeper. It's kind of like an Edward Hopper painting, you know, where there's this mystery mm -hmm. kind of, why is that person sitting alone at the counter or in the window seat, looking out the window? Yeah, d definitely uh, come across that way, you know, in my opinion, because there's, like I said, there's, there's a lot of questions like, what are they doing? What is this? <laughs> Uh, a little bit of abstract, which lends yeah. the lend to the fact that you know, because because you have some context, right? But there's yeah. also some abstraction. So yes, congratulations, good job. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity, and thank you all for spending some time with me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank let's you. finish the last presenter. We we have a little bit of time to chat at the at the end. It's it's almost uh, seven o'clock my time. So the last presenter today, last but not not least, um, is uh, we're gonna hit a home run, so to speak, today <laughs> with uh, uh, Theodora, um, and uh, she, I must say that uh, she is the furthest away from Los Angeles. Uh, those of you you don't know, she's in Romania. Oh. So it's about three or four a.m. in the morning, uh, local time for her. So thank you so much for spending the time with us. And uh, thank you. yeah, it's it's one of the, I guess one of the benefits of doing Zoom is that, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, artists, photographers from all over, who would who was able to join us. Uh, you know, we are open soul Los Angeles, but we're kind of opening it up to uh, many other people. So thank you. And then uh, Theodora, um, um, she's sharing a portfolio about memories today with us, I think, about yes. childhood, about potentially grieving and the sense of loss, uh, you know, all that emotion wrapped around an image. So that's also a good story, uh, backstory that I like to hear. So Theodora, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Just a moment. 
Okay. Um, everybody can see it? Yes. Okay, so before I will start, I will tell you a little bit about myself. I completed my bachelor studies at the National University of Arts in Bucharest within the Department of Photography and Time-Based Media Art. And currently I'm a master student at the same university and department. My artistic practices include photography, collage, performance, animation, and experimental film. Through my works, I explore themes such as childhood memories, the past-present relationship, social political issues, activism, personal experience, and feminism. So, the project I'm presenting is part of my bachelor thesis. My project explores how morning rituals, particularly grieving, materialize. These rituals hold a healing aspect, often considered cathartic in nature. Their role is one of healing, purification, and overcoming traumatic events associated with death. Following the passing of my grandparents, I unconsciously blocked the grieving period as I was not ready to go through it. Years later, I returned to this period desiring to go through it, to become aware of and accept the loss, and lastly, to pay tribute to the memory of my grandparents. The title, Don't Turn People Into Houses, is a wordplay originating from my own poetry. This photograph is a self-portrait with an embroidery made by my grandmother. My grandmother used to embroid, but unfortunately, this practice didn't capture my attention during my childhood. This year, I found her embroideries, which are among the few objects I have left from her. In the present, because of the need to feel closer to her, I started working with textiles. I found out that a close connection is formed between the textile material and the work of mourning. The textile is seen as a metaphor for the grief and the expression of the mourning, ex mourning experience. The Polaroid photographs were taken over the course of a year, during which I documented both the exterior and interior space of my childhood home, and indirectly the space where I live with my grandparents. Not long after the passing of my grandparents, I bought these two puppets from a second-hand store. I didn't photograph my grandparents very often, so now I don't have enough picture of them. These puppets can be seen as a visual prosthetic for them. I chose Polaroid photography because it's idyllic. It's a game in itself of discovery, search, preservation, and patience. The choice of Polaroid is motivated by the unique quality it possesses. The first photograph is taken in my former room. When I was born, my grandfather wrote the following words on the door. Welcome to your new home and everything you see is yours. That's why this room is very important for me. It was my first gift from my grandfather. When I was little, I used to play a lot in this room with him. He was my best friend and we did everything together. The second photograph is taken in my grandparents' room. After their passing, for a while, I refused to enter in this room. Now I'm starting spending time in it and rediscovering again. Memories are also unique objects. They cannot be changed, altered, transferred, or erased. The processing of memories is very important in the griefing process. After all, the memory replaces what we have lost. Certain objects have become connection between the existing space and the space designated for mourning, forming a bridge between the past and the present. The shirt in the picture is the only item I kept for my grandmother's clothes because it was her favorite. For a period of time, I kept the shirt on the chair. Now I move it to the hallway closet and I still avoid to open. It's difficult to look at, it's difficult to look at or to touch that shirt. Every time I see it, it reminds me of what I've lost. Tradition plays an important role in mourning and remembering those lost. The tradition of placing coins on grave or on funeral markers is an age-old custom in very various cultures. The use of coins in my project carries personal significance. My grandfather used to collect coins, carefully preserving them in a drawer. 
After his pace, after his passing, I personally fight this kind the coins, reminiscing about him. The coins mark the place where I used to spend time with my grandfather, parks being the most predominant. By placing the coins in different locations and on different surfaces, my project has taken on a performative character. In order to create a personal ritual, performativity is just an, as important as the creation of new personal sim symbols. Throughout history, rituals have always borrowed elements or constructed new ones. Uh, for the final exhibition of the university, the photographs were presented in the form of a book object. The book object is a method of archiving memories in the context, taking the shape of a journal. At the beginning, I mentioned that the project title is a wordplay originating from a poem I wrote. The poetry has also become a way of communicating with myself. The poem can be found at the beginning of the book. Philosopher Wilhelm Flusser often spoke about two gestures, the gesture of photography and the gesture of writing. For this project, I utilized both gestures, as when we wish to remember or preserve something specific, specific we use both of these gestures. The structure of the book is that, is that of a visual journey through memory. The notations on the Polaroids are added as a substitute for memory. This is a drawing I made in kindergarten for my grandfather. The notation on the Polaroid in the first picture represents how my grandfather and I spent winters. Despite our hands freezing, he always managed to pull out two candies from his pocket. The birthday greeting in the second photograph is from a card I made for my grandmother. Rituals are personal response that we filter through our need and desire. There is no blueprint for creating a ritual. Later, later, each individual will incorporate elements they find therapeutic for their cause. Therefore, the therapeutic approach plays a significant role. Through this work, a path is formed for traversing and reclaiming memories, and at the same time, can be serving as a means of anchoring oneself in the present. So, the, the idea for the project came from a conversation I had with my grandfather a few years ago. He told me that when you are no longer here, people begin to forget you. Don't turn people into houses is a tribute and a cathartic process of its own, and it's a tribute to my grandparents and an individual mechanism for accepting the past, including separation. While my grandparents' memory was destroyed by Alzheimer, my memory was affected by the shock of death. So in the end, grief is a stage that must be accepted and endured. And thank you all for staying with me for this project. Thank you, Theodora. I thank you. Yeah, that's very unique, uh, your project. Um, and you have a book too, so this is very... Uh, yes. Very yes. Um, let's see. Let's see if there's any other questions or comment. Uh, oh, somebody joining. Let me see. Amit. Okay, Amit, Diane. She probably just dropped uh, accidentally. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We have another Romani. <laughs> Small row, isn't it? Thank you for sharing your Thank project. You. I think that's Thank very you. unique and the. Um, and the uh, idea is very, um, um, you know, you, you, uh, different, you know. So what do your professors say? Just curious. Um, my uh, teacher was very, uh, I really like my teacher and she was really love, uh, she is a really lovely person and uh, she's very emotional and she resonates very well with my uh, project because it, uh, in the past, she was in a situation kind of like mine. And uh, yeah, she was really happy for me because I start to um, uh, talk about that. And the rest of my teacher, they were all amazing and they really like it, to be honest. 
That's good. I can I can see why. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. So uh, let's see if there's any other comments uh, I'm looking or questions. So I noticed some of the, the work of Polaroids. Yeah. Uh, were they were they old? Oh, did you do them recently? Uh, can you repeat, please? Um, some of your images are Polaroids, you know, like... Oh, uh, they were uh, all made old, for old this one? project. Yes, I for see. my bachelor thesis. So they're they're from your archive. Um, yes. You just found them. Okay, okay, cool. Nice. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you to all three presenters. And uh, if anybody else have uh, other comments or questions for any of them, uh, this is a good time to uh, to bring them up. Okay, looks like um, so. Um, Jon thank you, Jonas. Um, for those of you who would like to know, please uh, go ahead and, and check out uh, their websites, uh, Victor's website, and also connect with uh, Nancy, uh, with uh, Instagram, uh, and so on, so that you can follow their uh, artistic journey, because uh, I'm pretty sure that you'll be seeing a lot of new stuff uh, from these people. Um, and then Victor, for sure, he, he'll be doing a lot a lot more exper experimentation. So it'll be interest it'll be exciting to see what he comes up with next. So yeah, the the connect uh the connection information is there uh in the in the chat. You can click on it or you know cut and cut and paste it. Alrighty. Any other announcements that you can think of, Jonas? I think Think, I think we cover most of it uh, earlier on. And Matthew, thank you uh, for joining. Uh, we'd love to have you. In fact, uh, we have a, a few alumni today. Who are you guys? Alumni is Diana. Uh, Diane is alumni. Lee, right? Lee is alumni. Another Romanian C4 Ninel alumni. So thank you for coming back and uh and support us so and uh and nancy and uh theodora feel free i know this time is kind of tough for you theodora but for sure nancy you know okay <laughs> you're available um uh, you know join our open show events uh in the future so all righty so thank you so much. If there's nothing else, uh, I think we cover really, you know, really nice uh, three portfolios today. Uh, like I said, um, our next one is going to be uh, in person. So watch uh, for our email in person in Los Angeles. Uh, and then we hope to uh, do a simulcast, so to speak, uh, do a Zoom. At, at least other people can watch. Uh, so we're going to try to do that. Uh, next time around so with that thank you so much thank you for your time and uh, nancy and victor theodora thanks Bye -bye. Richard. thanks Jonas. Thank you. thanks everybody thank you, you so much everyone nancy um theodora and uh, victor can you stay behind for sure. just a couple minutes yeah.